Welcome to the commentary on Margaret Fuller and women's rights. Um, going to be discussing both Fuller and her uh, woman in the 19th century, as well as some information and also the text of the uh, Declaration of Sentiments and Resolutions for the Seneca Falls Women's Rights Convention in 1848. Um, first, to begin with, um, Fuller and Transcendentalism. Some people don't know an awful lot about Transcendentalism. This is not a class on Transcendentalism, but a few things that you really want to know. It's an, it, Transcendentalism, uh, an intellectual, cultural, literary, philosophical, spiritual uh, movement from about 1815 or so, really kind of the 1820s, honestly, uh, but the early, early inklings in the 18 uh, teens, um, all the way through about 1865. It had run, largely run its course by the end of the Civil War. Um, key names that you probably are already aware of, uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson, uh, Margaret Fuller, uh, Henry David Thoreau, um, and a number of other folks that are prominent figures within there that of lesser uh, renown. Um, Hawthorne, Poe, Melville, Whitman really aren't what you would consider to be full-fledged members of the Transcendentalist group, though they were associated with people who were part of the group. Uh, others, P uh, Christopher Pierce Cran uh, Cranch, um, uh, uh, William Ellery Channing, those folks, uh, Theodore Parker, a bunch of them uh, were involved in this movement, centered really in and around the Boston area, prominent area was conquered. Fuller, of course, was a, was, a, was a mainstay within that group, a very important member of that group, and she's not really credited with, that, with as much as she deserves, I think, in that regard. She was involved with uh, Bronson Alcott, um, father of Louisa May Alcott, who also was a prominent member of the Transcendentalist group and was someone who worked with him at the Temple School in Boston. If you have an opportunity to find out a little bit more about the Temple School, and you're interested in the early uh, history of, of education in America, very important, uh, rather radical approaches to, uh, to teaching and to pedagogy that have largely been forgotten. I mean, everybody remembers James Dewey, and everybody acknowledges James Dewey, but Bronson Alcott was doing some incredibly interesting, although sometimes quirky, kooky things uh, with, with education and young people um, some 30, 40, 50, 60 years even earlier than Dewey was doing it. So she was very much involved with it. She was, for a number of years, the editor-in-chief of the... Uh, transcendentalist periodical known as the Dial, and was uh, um, a a, uh, a a leading force. It was a whole lot of whole lot of work with not much remuneration, to be honest. Emerson did it for a while. Others did it for a while. She did it. Did the sort of the heavy lifting of it when other people kind of didn't want to do it. Uh, but she was important because she published a lot of really important works by important American writers and intellectuals at the time. So, you know, people don't don't give editors enough credit. Editors don't just edit. Editors go out and find great writers and get them to submit their materials and publish and discover great writers. And she had a tremendous contribution in that regard uh, for some of the most important American writers and thinkers, uh, particularly in areas of social commentary, but also literary and cultural. You have to understand the Transcendental Movement was a, was a movement that was about all these things together. It wasn't just a social movement or it wasn't just a political movement. Uh, it wasn't just a literary movement. It was all these things together. It was about reconceiving the human experience. You know, 30 years um, after the uh, rev revolution and 30, you know, or 50 years after the revolution, 30 years after sort of the founding of the country with the constitution and, and all of that, the key questions that were facing people were, well, what kind of country are we going to have? Um, and so it was really about, uh, it was a, it really was a movement that was about trying to define what the American experience was going to be like in a broader set of terms, not just a political uh, independence, not just political independence, but cultural independence. And that was introspective. So we don't have to go into all of transcendentalism, but I just wanted you to understand that it's a broader thing than some people give it credit for. They tend to, they tend to see it as a literary movement. And it was, I mean, all these prominent fi figures were, were associated with it, Fuller being one, but it, it was more than just that. Now, a thing that you want to also delve into, if you're interested in Fuller, is her background and her education. Her father, Timothy, was a brilliant man, but uh, if you read some of her autobiographical material, it's really, 
you know, it's kind of like how not to raise a child. Um, she was just very put upon as a child. Her father taught her to read and write before she was four years old. I mean, no kidding. He just had this incredibly regimented approach to her education. He was trying to create a genius. I mean, in a, in a weird kind of way, when you read her writings about her, her childhood, um, she was, she's, she's glad that she had a very, very thorough education, a far more thorough education than any other woman of her day. I mean, it's, it, I think it's no exaggeration to say that she was better educated than any woman on the North American continent at her time. There's just no question about it. Um, the problem is that, that, you know, you can push a kid and it really warps their personality. And she basically walks away saying, I had a terrible childhood because of this. I learned a lot. Yeah, I was highly educated, but I had a terrible, terrible childhood. I mean, she had nightmares and migraines. No kidding. Um, she, she, she lost a, 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 a sister, a sibling to a uh, disease. And, and this was a very traumatic thing. Her parents would, would have her study and study and study hour after hour, after hour, after hour, they wouldn't let her read certain things. I mean, she, she once was caught reading Shakespeare, for example, and they just threw a fit over it today. We would say, Oh, what well, that's really interesting. Uh, tell me what you liked about Shakespeare, et cetera. But no, not her parents, um, languages, philosophy, all these kinds of things, natural sciences. She was exceedingly well read, but not in things that she was interested in. And she basically grew up not having close friends because all the other girls that she played with or associated with had such a different upbringing. I mean, they just weren't educated to the extent that she was. And she really said, you know, in her autobiography, I just didn't have anything in common with these kids. I mean, I got along with them, but we just didn't ever talk, right? I mean, they had nothing to say, and I had nothing to say to them. So it was a really isolating experience for her to be raised so differently. You almost think that her father kind of raised her in a in a lab in a way. It's 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 kind of reminiscent, if you will, of um, of uh, B. F. Skinner and Walden too. You know, the way he raised B. F. Skinner raised his daughter in a box. Believe it or not, yeah, that's what he did, just to find out how it would <laughs> how things would transpire if you did it. Um, Kid grew up to be a normal person, but, um, you know, it, it, it's just, it's just a very, it, she had a very traumatizing childhood, although the end result was she was a b brilliantly educated person. When you look at Woman in the 19th Century, um, it is a text that has flashes of brilliance. There's no question when you read it that the person who wrote it is an exceedingly well-educated person. There's also no question that she really wants you to know that, right? I mean, talk about literary name dropping and digressions that are, there's no other word for it, at times, very pedantic. It is, all of that means that it is a very dense and very messy read. It is not a book that lends itself to a clear organizational structure. It's a pain to read, believe me. So if you read it and said, oh my Lord, this is very difficult to read, well, you're in good company because everybody who reads it thinks that. Even her contemporaries, even Emerson thought it was a, just a really tough read. It's got great stuff in it. And I'm just going to hit some of the highlights of it, but it's got great ideas and great stuff in it. It's just a really hard read. And frankly, when Fuller, who was very also very well known for the conversations that she held, Back in the day, you didn't hold speeches. You would have a series or a, a, a kind of a lecture series. For her, it was a, not a lecture so much as it was a conversation. She liked to bill it as conversations. She would have conversations um, at certain announced dates, places, times, and people from all over would come to these conversations. Emerson just had flat-out lectures. He would just go on a lecture circuit, but uh, Fuller would call them conversations. Even her conversations were a little hard to follow and somewhat... She was more of a global thinker rather than a linear thinker, if you want. I don't know. If, use whatever, you know, metaphor, metaphorical that you want. But um, she would kind of, uh, she was very associatively uh, uh, inclined. She would bring up something and then bring up something different, and then she would digress and make an allusion to something. And um, part of that, I think, probably was in order to show people how well-educated she was because she wanted to be taken seriously. And at that time, of course, women were not taken seriously. So you can't blame her, but it is a little bit of an annoying thing when you, you're, at a, you're stuck in a cocktail party and this person is just rattling on and you know that half of what she's saying is 
to try to impress you with what she knows. It's like, okay, I get it. I get it. You're really, really well educated, but can you get to the point, please? Anyway, having said that, let's touch on some of the highlights of the text. It's a very lengthy text. It probably could be whittled down to article length. Guess what? It was um, uh, the great lawsuit um, was was published in art in, in in article form. Um, but I wanted you to see it in its totality because there's so much more there than what it, just in the article form. But anyway, she's got this idea of man uh, and women. Um, but that man, meaning mankind, we would probably say humankind today. Um, made up of men and women and her theory basically or her what she her proposition is that is that humanity if you will is made up of men and women and they are two halves of a single entity and the argument is basically that without both halves being enriched or fulfilled or achieving their full potential there's no way that the species humanity itself man as she would say will ever progress or evolve to its greatest potential and she doesn't just mean in terms of technology we tend to think of progress as being technological or material she's thinking in terms of spiritual and moral progress primarily um, there's very little in the text about material progress. That's just not something transcendentalists uh, were all that interested in. And in fact, it's really not something that people in the 19th century were all that interested in until the latter half of the 19th century when you've got all these you know, innovations and industrialization and, and all those sorts of things. As an agrarian culture that was deeply religious the first half of the 19th century, progress was seen as moral progress, not material. So she's talking about the moral progress, enlightenment, intellectual progress. Um, but she doesn't, she doesn't believe that men and women are, the, the differences between men and women, and she sees them. She sees that there are differences between men and women. She believes that. But she does not believe that these are, that the differences are entirely gender based that that within each individual there are masculine feminine traits however you want to put it she even the, her famous line is there is no holy masculine man no purely feminine woman so she's saying these are two halves you know, people often say like right brain left brain is a good analogy kind of sort of if you want to think of that way of it that way that we all have sort of masculine and feminine traits but but femality and I guess masculinity, I don't know what, malality, I don't know what she would say, um, are, are traits that exhibit themselves in genders, in both genders, and that they run the gamut in terms of, you know, strength of one or, or dominance of one or, 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 or the other within each of it. So what she's trying to say is, look, the, humanity is made of men and women, right? Um, no man, no woman is purely masculine or purely feminine. We all have traits of both in us. And that's because we need to develop those characteristics, those qualities in tandem and not overly emphasize the strength, power, rights of one over the other. If we do that, it's like it's like working out one bicep and not working out the other. It's uh, I'm running out of analogies. Uh, it's 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 like favoring one part of our personality to the detriment of another. And this coming from a woman who felt that as a child she all of her creativity was nipped in the bud by all this heavy duty studying, right? So she knows a thing or two about having some aspect of herself overemphasized at the expense of other pursuits. So, okay, now that you know that little connection there, you can maybe it makes a little bit more sense. One of the things that we want to, I want to focus on particularly in this though in the time that I have here is the 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 moral and spiritual basis of her ideas on femality, right? It's a word that nobody really uses much anymore except in academic circles, but femality. Um she doesn't want to use the word femaleness, um, and she doesn't want to. She certainly doesn't want to use the word femininity because of all the connotations you can imagine, right? So she uses the term femality, and what she's saying is, if men continue to lead women, that is, make decisions for them, whether it's property decisions or political decisions or religious decisions and all this kind of stuff, what that's going to mean is that is that the the species, all of humanity, is not going to develop to a greater moral enlightenment for either sex, okay? Um, if, if men continue to, 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 to take the steering wheel all the time, then women will not develop to their full potential. And if they don't, then humanity as a whole won't. 
Um, so, so this is a this is a central tenet of the text. The other big thing within the text that, of course, has garnered a lot of attention. It's worthy of of consideration here very much. It's if not, it's probably the second most important thing about the text that she brings up, and she speaks of it in in great depth, in great length. I've only got a few minutes here to be able to talk about it, but the four types of marriage. Back up for a moment and talk a little bit about the type of marriage that was inherited, particularly in New England, from their forefathers, and that was the dominant type of marriage, or the paradigm of marriage, um, with males as the head of household. Um, and this was established, in, especially within Puritanism, from a scriptural authority, uh, really a very Old Testament kind of scriptural authority, to be honest with you, um, that, that males were the head of the household, women were subservient to men, um and and that was that, that was the dominant paradigm women didn't own property didn't they didn't need to own property men would take care of those kinds of things for them and that women had their realm or sphere and it was the domestic realm men were externally faced facing women were internally facing men men worked outside the home women worked within the home and the home very important as a symbol for the woman and her sphere of influence, uh, was focused on issues of domesticity, issues of childbirth and child rearing, issues of of um, you know domestic care, and so when you walked inside a home, it was the woman's realm, um, and a man may be the head of the household, but not the head of the house itself. Okay, he may be the head of the family. But he doesn't have the hands-on caretaking role that a woman does. So, so there was this real sort of division of labor that was very rigid. And we all know this, right? Um, and, of course, a lot of that is still holds over today. As much as we like to think of ourselves very progressive in that regard, it's still a lot of that today. Um, and I'm not so sure that some couples don't have, personal opinion here, don't have varying degrees of comfort with either traditional roles or not. I mean... You know, hopefully, you know, we're embracing a, a view today where couples should find what they their comfort level. If they want to be more traditional in that regard, fine. If they don't, they can do it the other way or an other way, whatever that other way is. Um, but th th there was really only one way that in, in, in Fuller's time. And so what she's arguing in here is that the dominant paradigm of man as the head of the household stunts the spiritual growth of both men, men and women. And she identifies four different types of marriages. Household partnership. And this is really, if you want to go back and take a look at Benjamin Franklin and the way he viewed his marriage. If you get a chance to read the autobiography, you really should. <clears throat> He's very much in the household partnership mode, kind of a business contract thing where couples get married in order to, you know, provide aid and comfort materially for one another. He is the provider. She is the caretaker and the, the nurturer. And it's a, it's, it's, it's like a business partnership. Benjamin Franklin, I would argue, having read a lot of his stuff, um, viewed his marriage that way. <clears throat> There's no question he viewed his marriage with Deborah Reed as completely a household part. He even says that we we married and we throve together. There's never a mention of a lot of affection for his wife. It's it's pretty much a domestic partnership. Um, this is, in, in Fuller's view, kind of the lowest rung on the ladder of, you know, better and better quality relationships. It's the one that's kind of biblically mandated for sure. Um, and it's this, you know, a good Puritan would say, well, that was what, that's what marriage was instituted for, uh, to bring children into the world and to support one another. And marriage does not extend beyond this lifetime. Um, and, uh, when it's done, it's done. Um, the second level is uh, mutual idolatry. So Fuller even recognizes that at this time, hey, we're post-romantic, aren't we? Or we're in the romantic movement in the United States. Romanticism as a movement started much earlier in the UK, in Britain, than, than it did in the United States. A good three decades earlier, in fact. So it, you're in the romantic era in the United States in the 1830s, 40s. 
1850s, and um, they've moved on to Victorianism and left their Wordsworth and Coleridge largely behind by this time. But um, Fuller is able to recognize, hey, you know, there are those relationships where it's not just about partnership and you take care of this and I'll take care of this and we'll thrive together and we'll have children and we'll persevere through this veil of tears. Um, instead, there are couples that are genuinely um, very affectionate towards one another, really love each other. They dote on each other. They're best friends. They're they're just really attached to each other. And that's a great thing. And, and Fuller recognizes that and says that that's an important kind of relationship. And it's, that's, that's certainly a more highly developed relationship than one that's just a business relationship. But it's not quite what it could be. And um, what she identifies as sort of the third type of marriage is intellectual companionship, where you really have this idea that we're not just helping each other on this planet, right, as man and wife, etc., husband and wife, um, you know, caretaker and provider, and we're not just fond of each other. We actually have this really deep intellectual connection with each other. And she, she, she points out many couples that have had you know, either in real life or in mythology or literature, all these different types of relationships. So she spends quite a bit of time sort of cataloging this, again, to impress us with how much she's read, probably, but that's all right. She can be forgiven. Um, uh, but there are a number of contemporary couples that she points to that that she says, these this this is a great marriage because there's great intellectual companionship. And, there, and in order for intellectual companionship to happen, you have to have an acceptance of... Um, intellectual equality on the part of the two participants. And so this can be very fulfilling, but it isn't the highest form of marriage. And she says the highest form is a spiritual form, the marriage of kindred souls. Now, once she gets up to this fourth level of marriage, that's when it becomes a little bit less specific, a little bit more ethereal and vague. And, it, and, and you and I in reading it say, okay, I kind of think I know what you're getting at, but boy, it's kind of hard to describe spiritual marriage, um, a deeper, more profound marriage of kindred souls. It's very lofty and idealized and therefore kind of hard to figure out exactly what that con what constitutes that kind of marriage. But even the third type of marriage, she argues, is not full development because it lacks a spiritual component. What you see in here, and I'm going to wrap real quickly and we'll go on to the second part of this, what you see in here are several different things. First of all, um, it shows that in the 19th century, marriage is evolving, it's transforming, it's, it's morphing into something different. There are people who are not satisfied with marriage as their parents and grandparents and all their ancestors saw it. And that is, it's a partnership. If you're lucky, you're fond of each other. If you're super lucky and you're highly intelligent and highly educated and in a very, very tiny micro minority, you might have some sort of intellectual companionship involved. But for the most part, it's people who work together to help each other and they're fond of each other. That's the vast, vast majority of marriages. By the 19th century, people are basically saying, we want more from marriage than this. It could be for a lot of different reasons. One, it could be that you know, the intellectual revolution known as the Enlightenment brought about a lot of changes in the way people saw marriages. Um, human existence is more than just enduring suffering. It's about achieving things and achieving things together and achieving happiness, right? Happiness as a concept is something that is, for the most part, in, in, in modern terms, something that doesn't come about until the 18th century. You talk to people in the 14th century about happiness and they'll kind of scratch their head and not quite understand what you're talking about. Um, so fulfillment, happiness is something that we get an expectation for or a desire for after the enlightenment. But, but in particular, spiritual, the idea of spiritualizing marriage. Do you know that most marriages in the 19th century didn't take place in churches at all? They took place in people's homes. Um, the Puritans didn't see marriage as a religious rite. They just didn't. It was a secular covenant that was sanctioned by God, but it wasn't something that was a religious activity or a religious ceremony so much as it was you honored your marriage just like you honored your business agreements, right? Not to do so would be a really bad thing. And I, I'm overstating it a bit, but it, it just, we tend to look for our soulmates. 
um, our soulmates, right? Are, are there's one person out there, destiny has this person in mind for me, and I've got to find them, and I'm on a quest for the, and the stars know, and God knows. and I mean, they just didn't see it that way prior to the 19th century. So that's one thing. The second thing is the, the very, very strong emphasis on self-reliance among transcendentalists like Fuller meant that what she, the basis of a good marriage, a fulfilling marriage, a fourth level marriage, is that you must first be self-reliant and then wed yourself to another person who is self-reliant and then together beginning first as individuals and only afterwards as people committed to helping each other um, and, 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 and becoming two souls united together will you be able to advance. And then the other thing too, to, to loop back around and in this, the literary and cultural nationalism. This text isn't just about women in the 19th century, it's, it's predominantly about American women in the 19th century, that, that British women and other women on the continent in the Western world you know, yes, there were people who wanted women to have more rights and to, to, to reach their full potential, but Fuller in this text, I think, comes across very distinctly as 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 implying that it is in the United States, it's in America, it's in this new country, this new world, where we have the greatest potential to make great strides in achieving that sort of thing. We are the great hope kind of thing um, for this as well as other things. In our next uh, slide, which I promise will be a little bit slower, uh, sh shorter than this in the next video, we'll talk about the linkage between the Seneca Rights Convention and women's rights and that of abolition right, this abolition of slavery.